Huh. Beautiful. There it is. <laughs> okay, so I get to be the awkward first couple couple sentences. Excellent. Uh, all right. Well, let me share my screen. It's first. It's great to be here. I appreciate the wonderful introduction, Alex, um, and and you and Jacob and everybody for putting together such a diverse and wonderful series of panels. I've been able to go to one or two, and I hope to be able to go to some more in the future. So let's get started. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rise of the global testing culture. Um, so thank you for the, the praise of my book. I appreciate that. And we're going to be linking the global testing culture to how the testing culture has shaped teachers, especially teacher appraisals and teacher satisfaction, teacher practices and perceptions. So we'll start a little bit with the rise of the global testing culture. And really here we see, looking back um, really until kind of the mid of the 20th century, but up until today, you see this rise and the number and types of assessment out there. So we see increased participation in testing. We look at really from the start of PISA in 1999, and you see the rise of Thames and Pearls and other international assessments, a sharp increase in the number of countries participating in that, moving well beyond Western countries and developed countries. We also saw a rise of national assessments, uh, increased by over 100% from 95 to 2006, but just not just the number of countries participating in assessment, but countries participating in more and more assessments within the country itself. So lots and lots of testing going on. Uh, I'm sure that's not a big surprise to anybody here. So there's been a change in the nature of testing. So this looks at PISA, uh, looking at a principal questionnaire in PISA and asking basically how many times does your school participate in externally standard, external standardized testing. And the most important thing here for me is the green bar, where we get to see basically a doubling of the number of schools that are doing at least two or more external standardized tests a year. All right, so we have a change in the type of testing, the nature of testing. This figure here is from Tony Verger and colleagues, Barcelona. And here they're looking at census versus sample-based assessments. Okay. And we see really a sharp increase in that orange bar, which is census assessments. So census assessments meaning everybody is taking that test instead of just a sample of individuals. So we have more tests. We have more tests that everybody needs to take. And this made me think about, well, what are the different types of testing out there and how do we capture this transformation? So I've talked about, this is four different types of test, and I like alliteration, so you get A's here, four A's, different types of testing. So testing for assessment, right? And this might be more informative test, but it could also be end of unit test where we're really just trying to assess what do students know. We've got testing for advancement. And this is often what we think about when we think of high stakes student test where there's an entrance exam or a placement exam, um, maybe even an exit exam, something that's you're doing the test to determine whether you can advance or to what area you're able to advance to. So maybe it's an academic track versus a vocational track and you're doing a test to figure that out. We can think of testing for accreditation where there's really nothing to move on to, but it gives you credits or credits you for a certain skill set or certain knowledge base. All right, we can think of teacher certification exams for that. And what I focus on is really what I've talked about is testing for accountability. And that's where the tests are really designed to hold educators accountable. All right, so tests, exams, assessments that are increasingly holding teachers and schools accountable for student test scores. And what I think we're seeing really in the first two decades of the 2000s is an increasing movement towards more and more testing for accountability, where the stakes and the accountability have moved away from students and families or, um, and really to the school. So there's more and more emphasis on teachers and schools being responsible for student test scores. So testing for accountability is one of my 
early focus points. When I was doing my work for David Baker, I was looking at testing for accountability and national testing policy categories. If I look further and try to break down testing for accountability into categories, I can see very clearly that they separate into two types of accountability, right? So the, the top line there is what I've talked about as evaluative testing policies. And the bottom is what I've talked about as punitive national testing policies. And each type of testing for accountability has a different philosophy behind it that we should be somewhat familiar with, right? So if we think of evaluative policies, so policies that are designed to evaluate schools based on student test scores. And usually this is evaluating and then providing information to parents to choose. So this is a market-based philosophy where we're looking at between school competition and the consumer then is supposedly in a, an ideal market is using this information to evaluate schools based on the available information and choose the best school and the best schools represented in these test scores. And the idea behind this is if we have a market-based accountability approach that educators and schools are gonna then change their behavior to meet the consumer demand and ensure adequate enrollment. So if parents don't like it, they're gonna change to make sure parents like it, to make sure they survive in a market. The other type of testing for accountability is what I've talked about as punitive and in an odd instance talked about as formative sanction reward. Um, that's mainly because the OECD didn't like punitive when I was working for them. So we need to talk about it as formative sanction reward category. So I typically talk about it as punitive where test scores are designed to punish and reward. But oddly, when you look at countries that reward, there's almost always a punishment. And the punishment is the motivation for schools. So we have behaviorist approach where the policy lever is these formal sanctions rewards. So it's a carrot and stick approach here. The idea here is that regulatory agencies are going to sanction low performers or reward high performers, and that you're either going to want to be rewarded or you're going to avoid being sanctioned and you're going to change your behavior accordingly. So we have a rise in testing for accountability. It includes both a evaluative or market approach and a punitive approach. And then I wanted to see, well, how, how much, I guess, how common is this around the world? Right. So I spent six years teaching during No Child Left Behind in the United States. I'm well aware of the history of testing for accountability in the US. But where else is it? So when I was at UNESCO's Global Education Monitoring Report, we, I was there, I guess, mainly to do the accountability report there. And we took the national testing policy categories and did a policy analysis of 101 countries and trying to figure out which of these testing policies fit each country. And then we separated these into the OECD education systems and non-OECD education systems. And you can see at the very bottom, so the gray and light blue are two testing for accountability policies. So those are the ones that I'm most interested in. Summative means that national tests are just used to summarize, um, but not either evaluate or punish schools, um, which means that it's not publicly available to make school rankings and move forward. And then some countries don't have a national test, very few though, and that, that percentage is shrinking. So here we can see that testing for accountability is common in over 50% of OECD systems with about a quarter applying punishment based on student test scores, and then just over a third using student test scores for the market. Yeah. We see a smaller, but not insignificant number in non-OECD countries, where we have 45% of non-OECD countries using testing for accountability. So we have this rise in number of tests and the type of test and who's responsible for the score. And that got me to the global testing culture. Think about, well, how does this, really change education 
change how we understand education, change what we see as quality in education, change our views of education. And in the Global Testing Culture book, um, I define global testing culture as a culture in which high stakes standardized testing is accepted as a foundational practice in education and shapes how education is understood in society and how education is used by its stakeholders. So this perspective draws from a world culture or, or sociological neo-institutional approach, right, where we have sets of common values that then lead to cultural models or scripts that talk about legitimate or appropriate behavior. And so underneath these values are core assumptions, right? How is the world made? Um, how do you understand the world? This could be, you can think about this as your epistemology and ontology if you want. So when I think about the, world, the global testing culture, I see two core assumptions. One is it's very much a positivist perspective, right? Where we can objectively see and measure the world, right? So we can quantify things. There's a single world out there that we can quantify and understand. The other core assumption is this individualism assumption that the outcomes of our life are based on our individual efforts, right? So we control our own destiny here. From these assumptions, there are values that are commonly understood in world culture theory as part of the world culture currently. We can think of how each of these values relate or might play out in a global testing culture. Right? So education as a human right might be a value. We believe all children have the right to a high quality education. Well, how do we know that? How are we going to ensure that everybody has the right to a high quality education? Well, one potential response is, well, we need to make sure that we're assessing everybody to make sure it's not just access, but they have access to quality outcomes. We can think about the movement towards academic intelligence. So certain types of intelligence are valued over others, right? Usually those that are academic or more cognitive in nature. We can think of math and science in this aspect. And when we look at the commonly tested subjects, we can see math and science and reading are the most commonly tested subjects around the world. We have a faith in science. We believe we can get to the truth and that that truth can be measured. We have increased decentralization in education systems. So and as we're giving more and more authority to local actors, how do we make sure that education is equally implemented and fairly implemented? Well, some would argue that this is why we need accountability. This is why we need a measure to make sure that each school is providing high quality education and that test scores are that measure. And finally, another selected value would be neoliberalism. So obviously that fits nicely into the market approach the testing for accountability, where we have test scores as the piece of information for the consumers to act upon, consumers here being parents. So we have core assumptions, we have shared values that we see within the world culture. And those values then dictate cultural models that provide scripts or the normative behavior we would expect for all actors within education. And those that don't follow those models or scripts are therefore seen as less legitimate or maybe even deviant within this approach. So there are lots of different actors in education. So you can think about how these scripts might play out across the different actors. But just some examples here. We can think about in a global testing culture, what are the expectations for parents, right? If these are the values and the assumptions, then those parents that don't use test scores in school choice decisions are shunned or chastised. We can think about how do we perceive parents when they start talking about, well, I didn't choose something based on the league table or the school ranking. I chose something based on my comfort with the teachers, right? Or the distance to the school. And we start thinking about, well, you don't care enough about your students' quality education. 
you really cared about the quality education they received, this is what you would be looking at. They think about how this shapes teachers. So those that don't adequately prepare their students for tests, especially in this high testing for accountability environment, are considered bad teachers, and their competence might be doubted by their colleagues. And students. Students become a burden. Right? So those who don't perform well in the test are seen as a liability. And we see a lot of this with the exclusion policies and these high stakes environments where we try to push out students um, from, from schools that we think might drag down our student, our school test score. So when I look at how is this culture shaping schools and teachers, I'm gonna spend most of this time talking about teachers, but just one example of, of school practices. So in this middle of the Venn diagram, you have an analysis that looks at how do school practices differ for those schools that are placed in a testing for accountability policy country. So those that are in the, the, the formal sanction reward or summative, right? So punitive or summative, this was an OECD publication, so it was a little different. compared to those that don't have that type of testing for accountability. So those that don't use student test scores to hold schools and teachers accountable. We see that those in a testing for accountability country use standardized tests more, they use tests for school monitoring more, they use tests for parent school comparisons more, they use tests for school to school comparisons more, they publicly post test scores, they're more often to be private, they spend more time on math, they're more selective, which is that pushing students out that might be a liability. So they have more selective admissions. They're also more selective to remove students that are low performing. A couple of odd things that I'm not gonna get into here is they're more likely to have extracurricular activities. And at the bottom, they're more likely to use test scores for principal evaluation and use test scores for teacher evaluation. So there is some shaping going on at the school level within these broader global testing cultures. Okay, so that gets me to what I wanna focus on today, which is global testing culture and teachers. And I'm gonna draw mainly from two articles that I've got published here. The first looks at student test scores and teacher appraisals. So historically, you'll see a difference between appraisals and evaluations, right? And I had, as I was writing this, my wife's a teacher educator, and we had interesting conversations about are appraisals high stakes? Are there, is there still a big difference between evaluations and appraisals? And historically, appraisals have been more formative and supportive, evaluations have been summative and used for monitoring teachers. But recently, we see appraisals actually used as a summative accountability tool. So this has increased a little bit with the idea that we need to manage teachers. Um, we still recognize them as the key to education and if education is so important, then we need to kind of corral them and direct them. Um, we can think about the reduction in teacher status in a lot of countries related to managerialism. The importance of teacher salary dominating the education budget. We think about accountability. We think about, are you getting the best value for money out there? And then the sense that test scores are equivalent to quality. So with all of these different pieces, we see appraisals becoming more and more often used as a summative accountability tool. So in this paper with Koska Kubaka, we ask three questions. One is just how common are the use of student test scores and high stakes in teacher appraisals, just very descriptively. Looking at 33 countries, how common are student test scores incorporated in appraisals and how often are high stakes attached to those appraisals? How much important importance then is placed on these different components of teacher feedback, right? Appraisals aren't just based on student test scores most of the time. It's very rarely the case. 
lots of different different characteristics and components that are there within teacher evaluations and teacher appraisals. And third, how does teachers' perceptions of their feedback utility differ by the degree test scores are emphasized in their feedback? So we're using the 2013 Teaching and Learning International Survey, which is done from the OECD, covering 33 countries. And for those that are interested in methods, we're using hierarchical generalized linear models. So before we get here, we need to define stakes. So I'm asking how many appraisals are high stakes. So let's do a definition. Uh, here I'm drawing from Larson's definition. They, Larson says that appraisal results are high stakes if they're tied to increases in salary, promotion, and maintenance and employment. So when I look at TALIS questionnaires, a teacher is in a, has a high stakes appraisal if any of the following are reported by them. So their appraisal results in material sanctions, such as reduced annual increases in pay. They result in a change in the teacher's salary or payment of financial bonus. There's a change in the likelihood that the teacher's career advances or, or the teacher is dismissed or non-renewed based on their appraisal. So if any of those happen, we have a high stakes appraisal. So just descriptive, what, is, what do appraisals look like across these 33 countries? And so we pull all the data together and most of the appraisals I was happy to see are what we considered multi-metric teacher appraisals, right? So almost two thirds of teachers in these 33 countries reported that their appraisals were actually based on six characteristics. And so student test scores, teacher observations, student surveys, parent feedback, an assessment of their own knowledge, and a teacher self-assessment. So we can see it quite a portfolio approach to teacher appraisals here. But does that mean that each of these components are given equal emphasis in the appraisal? So I apologize, I'm a quant guy, so you're gonna see a lot of different figures here, uh, but I, I'm gonna walk us through here. So here we have each of the countries as a diamond. And our x-axis or horizontal axis is the percentage or the percent of teachers in that country that have reported test scores are included in their appraisal. The vertical or y-axis is the percent of teachers in that country that report their appraisal is high stakes. And the intercept here is the mean across all the TALIS countries. So we can see just by looking at the intercept that across all countries, about 97% of teachers report that student test scores are included in their appraisals. This is the highest number, it's basically equal to teacher observations. Out of those six components, test scores, really important. And if we look at the y-axis, we see that nearly 80% of teachers report that their appraisals are high stakes. I've highlighted here a couple of outliers. All right, so we can see Finland over by itself, which may not be a huge surprise. Uh, it might be a little bit of surprise that over 80% of teachers in Finland report their appraisals are high stakes, but about 75% report their test scores of their students are included in their appraisals. And at the bottom right, we see kind of a group of countries here that all have very, I guess, relatively low stakes for their appraisals, all right? So these are all countries where less than half of teachers report their appraisals being high stakes including in Japan, where we have under 30% of teachers report any high stakes in their appraisals. So we do have some outliers, but overall we have a very high percentage of teachers reporting that test scores are included in their appraisals and that their appraisals are high stakes. So moving along. 
One of the other questions we explored was appraisal feedback. So this is a question that asks basically how much emphasis does your school head or principal give to each component and the appraisal? All right, so when they give you feedback, what do they focus on? And this is on a scale from one to four, where four being the highest, most emphasized. We can see on the left side, basically the different components we've already talked about. And the center column are how those are represented in the TALIS questionnaire. And on the right, we see the importance placed on the feedback in the form of a mean. So the higher number here means that there's greatest importance. This is teachers' perceptions of how much emphasis their principals place when they're giving them their feedback on their appraisal. And here we see that not all components are seen equally, valued equally, and that typically, student test scores receive the most emphasis from principals and school heads when they're talking to teachers about their appraisal. And we see some stuff on the other side as well, right? So teaching in a multicultural, multilingual setting is at the very bottom, it's well below everything else. And then some of the types of collaborative aspects of teaching, so providing feedback that teachers can provide to other teachers, um, very low as well. So out of all the different components, we see that most emphasized are student test scores when teachers get their feedback. So next, I just want to see out of the different, let me go back one. So out of everything we see in the middle column here, out of all these potential focus points for appraisal feedback, where do student test scores rank in each country, right? So here we can see overall, they are considered the most emphasized piece of feedback, but is that true in all countries? So that's what the ranking at the bottom is. So once again, each diamond represents a country and the ranking at the bottom is the rank of student test scores as part of the appraisal feedback in that country. So one means that they are the most emphasized piece of feedback that teachers get in that country. And if we look at the very top, we see England and the United States up there, and I'll explain the y-axis in a second, uh, along with most other countries. And then again, we see Japan look very different. So out of this big list in the middle, student test scores or achievement for Japan is only the seventh most emphasized piece of feedback that teachers get. And we see some of the other countries that were also outliers on this right side, including Finland. The y-axis is the difference from the mean score. So here, I'm taking the mean score, so if I was doing this overall, I would take the 3.47, and I'm subtracting it from the mean score of everything else. Okay. So I've got the score, the emphasized score of student for student test scores and appraisals, and I'm subtracting it from the average emphasis on all other components. And not surprisingly, since overall student test scores are emphasized the most, all countries have a positive number here, meaning student test scores minus the average of all other areas is positive. But what this does is also it highlights those countries that are most test obsessed, right? And you can really see that in the top left here. And it's not a surprise to anybody who studies this, that England and the United States is up there. So not only are student test scores the most commonly emphasized, but the gap between how much they're emphasized and everything else is much, much larger in England and the United States than any other country. So that sounds fine and all, but does it have an impact, right? Does that seem to be associated with any difference for teachers beyond this emphasis piece? And so I wanted to look at two things, and these are all student teacher perceptions, 
right? These are all teachers self-reported. But at the end, they asked teachers, well, how much impact did your appraisal feedback make in your teaching? And did you see this as an administrative task? So the utility of your appraisal feedback, was it useful? Here, we're reporting log odds. Uh, so if you're not familiar with log odds, something over one means that there's a positive or association or increase. Something under one means it's less common. And I'm focusing on the relative importance. Okay, so that's that relative measure. How much is our test scores emphasized in the feedback compared to everything else? And we can see as the relative importance increases, so as the relative emphasis on student test scores and appraisal feedback increases, teachers are more likely to say that the appraisal really makes little impact on their instruction. And they're more likely to say it to seem like a box checking activity. It was only administrative. So that's our first piece. And the conclusions from this are that former teacher appraisals seem to be disappearing. There's increased high stakes associated with teacher appraisals. Although appraisals tend to contain multiple measures, they're not all equally emphasized. That test-based high stakes appraisals are common in many countries. And that when you emphasize, emphasize test scores, it's associated with a decrease in the perceived utility of that feedback. All right. So let's go to the next piece. So following up with that, I wanted to know, well, is any of this associated with satisfaction of teachers? Okay. This is a more recent piece I've done with Jessica Holloway, who's an academic in Australia. And satisfaction is important as a teacher and as somebody who cares a lot about teachers, my wife, important that teachers are satisfied in their position. And when we look at the literature, we see that testing for accountability or test-based accountability is typically associated with a reduction in teacher satisfaction. Right? And it's little bits of the literature that testing for accountability can shift the focus from collaborative to a competitive environment, which is associated with decreased satisfaction. Um, Colleagues have shown that in New Jersey, teachers opposed test-based evaluation systems, that in China, negative perceptions of test-based accountability was associated with te decreased teacher satisfaction, and that test-based accountability has been related to attrition in the state of Georgia and the US, and also here in the UK. So an important piece for us to care about teachers. So in this kind of follow-up piece, I wanted to examine whether the appraisals that we just looked at are one potential path to explain the relationship between test-based accountability and teacher satisfaction. So there are two questions here. First is what is the relationship between a school testing culture and teacher satisfaction, recognizing that testing cultures, cultures shape how we understand and behave in education. And is this relationship mediated by the feedback teachers receive on their appraisals? So I'm gonna give a little more detail uh, on this, just with some of the data and methods. So again, I'm using the 2013 Teaching uh, International Learning Survey. We have 33 participating countries. My initial sample is just over 100,000 teachers. And I'm using a slightly different approach here, a multi-level path analysis. Um, okay, so teacher satisfaction. Uh, TALIS has six measures of teacher satisfaction. I'm only using three of them. And this, and I'm using the, the measures of teacher satisfaction that are specific to their school, right? Because I'm interested in how the school testing culture shapes them, not the overall perception of teachers in the country. So I'm gonna create a composite of these three specific satisfaction, we end up with a range of zero being there's very little 
or low satisfaction, three being high satisfaction. And what I was happy to see is that overall teachers reporting being fairly satisfied. Right? So 2.4, that's well over the 1.5 half. So generally pretty high satisfaction for teachers. And I standardize this in my analysis just for interpretation things. Okay, to capture the school testing culture. So is a school using high stakes and making teachers accountable for student test scores? So there are two things that I use to look at school testing culture. One is a question for two principals, asking them, do you ensure teachers know they're responsible for students' learning outcomes? And that ranges from zero to three. We can see the mean is about a two. So it's just basically more often than not, principals report that yes, I make sure everybody knows, all the teachers know they're responsible for student outcomes. And then as we saw in the last article, that test scores are included in the teacher appraisal and that's about 97%. Okay, so those are the two measures I'm using to talk about whether the school has adopted a, a testing culture. But I'm also interested in teacher appraisal. So we'll start at the bottom here. This is my relative importance from the last one, um, probably written out much cleaner than I explained it in the last article, where we're looking at emphasis of the test score minus the mean emphasis of all other factors in appraisals. And remember the black dot in that figure, we saw an overall mean above zero, right? Because test scores are the most emphasized piece overall. Other, so the overall mean across all 33 countries is 0 0.36. And at the top, I'm also now adding whether teachers report that their appraisal feedback impacted their job satisfaction. And going from zero to three again, with three meaning that yes, there's this lar large positive change in my satisfaction based on this appraisal feedback. And most seem to say, yeah, it was somewhat positive. Okay. So now we're gonna get to some figures. We're gonna walk through this fairly slowly. The first thing we do here is look at a direct relationship between our school testing culture. So are our teachers held responsible for student achievement and our test scores included in teacher appraisals. And I wanna see if there's a relationship between those and teacher satisfaction. And all of these analysis were controlling for a teacher sex, years of education, or sorry, years of experience, age, and level of education. So in our first model, we can see something that I was a little surprised about, which is that there's actually not a significant direct relationship here. Right, so our p-values or our significant levels are all over 0 0.05. And while our coefficients are in the, the direction I expect, they're not significantly related to teacher satisfaction. On our second model, we include one of the appraisal variables. Okay, so this is the variable that asks teachers has your appraisal feedback positively impacted your satisfaction? And not surprising, when teachers say it's positively impacted their satisfaction, they're more likely to positively report being satisfied. But what this does is suddenly our relationship between school testing culture and teacher satisfaction changes to more of what we might expect, right? To where there's a negative association between teachers being responsible for student achievement and how satisfied they are in the school and the test scores, including teacher appraisals and how satisfied they are in the school. What this does is it gives us a little hint that appraisal feedback might be really important for this relationship. So finally, I add this other piece and now we've got a mess of a model here. So the emphasis of test, of test scores and appraisal feedback. So, and if we start 
from teachers are responsible for achievement. What we see here is a direct negative association with teacher satisfaction. But if we go up, we see teachers are responsible for achievement as a positive association with how much emphasis is placed on test scores and appraisal feedback, right? So the more principals say, yes, we emphasize to teachers that they're responsible, we also talk to, that, talk to them more about test scores and their appraisal feedback. And if we continue along the top, oh, sorry, let's, uh, let's go. So if we go uh, down to the other part of the school testing culture, test scores, including teacher appraisals, we see a very similar pattern where we have a direct negative relationship. Test scores included in the teacher appraisals, we have less teacher satisfaction. We also have, similar to the other school testing culture variable, the more test scores are included in teacher appraisals, the more likely test scores are emphasized in that teacher's appraisal feedback. All right, so now we're up at emphasis of test scores and appraisal feedback. We see that when test scores are emphasized in appraisal feedback, they have a negative effect on teacher satisfaction. And importantly here, when you emphasize test scores and appraisal feedback, it has a negative association with whether or not teachers believe that their appraisal feedback was good for their satisfaction. And that link really diminishes the potential benefits of teacher appraisals. Right. So again, we've got school testing culture. Satisfaction and school testing culture increases the likelihood we're going to emphasize test scores and appraisal feedback, which reduces the potential positive benefits of teacher appraisals on teacher satisfaction. We think about how much. So everything in kind of gray, light blue, and, and darker blue here represents basically how satisfied teachers are overall, right? And we saw that overall they were quite satisfied. So if they were fully satisfied, this whole thing would have been blue. But yeah, quite satisfied at this point. But when there is any type of school testing culture, Generally, teacher satisfaction goes down by 10%. When you're at the most intense school testing culture, teacher satisfaction goes down by another 3.7%. So that's the overall effect of school testing culture on teacher satisfaction when you start doing all the calculations from this mess of the model. Okay. So what are some of the conclusions we have here? that school testing culture has a direct negative relationship with teacher satisfaction, that school testing culture indirectly reduces teacher satisfaction by mediating, reducing the potential benefits of teacher appraisals. And I would argue that this speaks to this larger global testing culture I talked about earlier that teachers are embedded in and that these test scores are therefore shaping teachers' experience in school. All right, a couple of final thoughts, uh, and then I'm really excited to answer any questions. A couple of further questions for the future. Uh, one is what's being pushed out or underemphasized. Right, we, when we looked at the appraisal feedback, we saw that especially teachers and teaching for multilingual and multicultural students is underemphasized. And this is another figure from the GEM report, which basically shows that teachers with high concentrations of multicultural, multilingual students in the classroom are not really effectively trained for multicultural, multilingual students. And so that combined with lower emphasis may mean that we're putting emphasis on math, reading, science, test scores, we might be missing a large and important part of education. Another further question worth exploring are some of these outliers that we're seeing. All right, so consistently, when we looked at teacher appraisals, we saw Finland and Japan and others that were outliers. What is 
the school testing culture, the global testing culture look like in these countries? How is the heterogeneity within the country really affecting teachers' experience there? So is there a larger gap since there's fewer individuals with test-based high stakes appraisal systems? Is there a larger gap in satisfaction between those that are in that path, between those that aren't? And those are just interesting questions that I'm mulling around in my head after these. Okay. So that's it for me. Um, yeah, please do ask any questions. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, LinkedIn, email me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and then obviously my additional resources and references there. So thank you so much, Will. Yep. I, I, if we were in a room, we'd be clapping, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for, uh, for sharing that research. I know we have a lot of uh, folks joining us today who are, who are classroom educators or who are working in assessment and accountability or um, have some other professional or research connection to this topic. So um, as you guys know, I, I probably could keep talking about this, but I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask uh, you all what your questions are. I see that Joe Elefante posted a question a little earlier in the talk, and I don't know if, uh, if Joe, you want to ask that yourself or? Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, thank you, Dr. Wiseman. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Smith. It's a fantastic presentation. Uh, really, really great. Super interesting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I posted this during the first uh, article presentation, but it really it applies to both. I'm just curious in your analysis: Are you looking at teachers that really only focus on those tested subjects, or are you looking at all teachers across the board in your analysis? Yeah. So, uh, Talis uses lower secondary uh, teachers um, for their analysis. I'm not distinguishing it by tested subjects because that would take quite a bit of exercise if I'm looking at tested subjects in each of those. Um, but I am looking at whether it's just teachers reports, whether or not they're using some type of student test score and their appraisal feedback. I do, my other bits of research would probably suggest that tested subjects are more likely to be heavily emphasized and tested grades, um, even outside of the subject and a tested grade would be more emphasized. Joe, you're wondering where all the music teachers are? Well, not just the music teachers, but you know, the world language teachers, the phys ed teachers, the whole, the whole gamut. I was, a, I was a social studies teacher, so, but still was required to do like reading and math exercises in my history class. Unsurprising. Yeah. <laughs> well, I see Marianne has also posted a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Um, which we can take a look at, or Marianne, you can ask those out loud if you want. Uh, you sure. Know. Yeah, I'm Marianne, and I'm also a um, classroom teacher in special ed and social studies. So uh, <laughs> when earlier in the presentation, you had the word common, and I was wanting to know um, when you use a term that is a matter of perception, do you have a, a certain number in your mind that puts you over to uncommon or common. Then the second question was, I haven't read your articles yet, so I don't know you like Dr. Wiseman does, but what um, theories did you use or compare going into it? And mm -hmm. then lastly, I liked the presentation, so I wanted to know what software or um, you used. I like the clean uh, version of it, so thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I think, uh, so for common, it's interesting because I totally agree thinking about subjective terms and how challenging those are. Um, so I, I think we're looking at how common are the use of student test scores and high stakes in teacher appraisals. So this is, I guess we get to talk about frequency here. I was just looking at how often are they used instead of common. So that would probably be a language piece that I can clean up some on. Um, but yeah, I didn't mean it like that. I just thought yeah. with you being such a quantitative person. Yeah, I was so, sorry about that. I, I was just thinking about uh, frequency. So common would just be, you know, how often is do we see this present in the data? Um, and then theoretical frameworks, um, perhaps not surprising given who my advisor was. Uh, I, I tend to use neo-institutionalism in a lot of my things and I understand 
you know, some of the world society, world culture, and some of the critiques of world culture out there. But I think, um, and, you know, those critiques are important in understanding that, you know, sometimes often missing in world culture is this sense of power and agency. Um, but when I'm looking at trends over different systems and, you know, world culture focuses on, you would expect greater heterogeneity across these different systems. So why might this be? Why might we be seeing the similarity? Um, so I, I think it does a decent job of capturing global testing culture. Um, although I, I, you know, you can read stuff from uh, Christian Maroy, um, who looks at as uh, a testing culture in Canada and sees something a little different than I do. Um, so there is there is some pushback there, but I I tend to use any institutionalism or, or world culture perspective here. And yeah, and I'm uh, for for the software. I'm just using the, uh, what is it called? So I'm, I'm just using PowerPoint and using design ideas, if you have to use that. And trying, the challenge I have with that is I haven't figured out how to do it once and then like have that be useful for the whole thing. Um, but I mean, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint and use it. You know, feel free to use that as a template if you want, but I just use the design ideas. It takes me a long time to figure out what I wanna do, but there we go. I'm glad you, I'm glad you appreciated it, thanks. Other questions? Well, I have a, I have a question if that's okay, Will. Um, sure. uh, first of all, I, you said sociological, you know, institutionalism. I, I figured everyone automatically, their brains when you said that went to scripting, legitimacy seeking and loose coupling because those, mm -hmm. those are, if you've had me in a theory related class before, you, you've heard that. Um, no, I wondered, so when we're, Talking about this this global testing culture and the way that uh, an emphasis on uh, testing outcomes tends to affect teacher satisfaction, often in a, a, a negative direction. Um, you know, a lot of what I think we try to think about is how does this research help us understand policies related to accountability and assessment, or ways that we can maybe ameliorate some of those satisfaction issues. Did you did you find anything uh, in your in your research that would suggest you know, um, not just that there is this global testing culture and that it's having this effect, but what are ways that maybe policymakers or uh, administrators or, or others who are working with teachers on accountability and assessment might be able to sort of help them use that better or maybe help, uh, I don't know, shift attitudes, sort of something. How do you translate it to practice? Yeah, so I think, uh, so in a different piece, we're looking at, at satisfaction and high poverty schools in Eastern Europe. And in that, we saw a sense of, of teacher participation, right? So teachers that feel like they have some control or participation in the system, that have some input into school policy, and the, the greater teachers feel valued. I mean, it's, it's not a surprise to teachers, but it's still important to push to policymakers. The more teachers feel valued and like they're are the experts they are in the classroom that they have input into the policies that affect them, um, the happier they are in the schools. And so this is something that uh, Aaron Benavut at SUNY Albany and I have talked about as structured democratic voice in the broader, more macro perspective, um, where we have the need to actually structure in the policymaking process opportunities for different actors in education to have voice, especially teachers, right? So one of the analysis we did for uh, the GEM report is, is looking at, and I think we did this with Education International, um, that you know most, um, most of the countries they surveyed, teachers didn't have any input into policies such as curriculum policy or things we would expect them to have input into um, that directly affects them. And, for a structured democratic voice, we think that's especially important for accountability, that the more teachers have a voice in policies that impact them, the more they're able to trust that there's a system in place that is fair and genuine and cares for them. And the more likely it's gonna be successful. So I think that that's some of the big inputs for me is just how do we increase 
the status and value of teachers and how do we really appreciate them as experts and include them into some of these discussions. Yeah, fascinating. We are unfortunately um, out of time. I, I think, uh, so my next question, which we don't have time for, and so we're not gonna talk about, but I wanna know, did COVID break the global testing culture? That's <laughs> that's the next topic. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've. <laughs> it, I see all the people yeah. shaking their heads no. <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. Like the, the UK freaked out for COVID just real quickly. The UK yeah. freaked out for COVID because exams were paused and teachers had to give scores to students. And I'm coming from the US, I'm like, yes, teachers give scores to students. That's okay. And everybody freaked out and thought that that was not the way to go. You cannot have teachers giving students scores. We need into the exam back. So I'm actually, I have a panel at the end of April on uh, on the exam culture in the U UK and does it do more harm than good. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking about that. Then. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith. Will, it really was enlightening. Uh, I again want to encourage everybody, if you have other questions, you can follow up directly with uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, you should definitely be following um, him on Twitter and the Moray House on Twitter. Um, I think you'll really find it interesting. So thank you so much. I also want to remind everybody that a recording of this presentation will be available on our Expand Ed website and, and Dr. Kirksey's YouTube, if you have access to that um, as soon as uh, possible. Thanks, Will. All right. Thanks, everybody. Do reach out if you've got questions or I can be of assistance. Bye, everyone. Bye.